fact that the senator, while indoctrinated, could not explain his toxicity. <laughs> You should not listen to men's rights advocates if you want to know what they have to say. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Honey Badger Radio, or more accurately, Honey Badger live streams. And this is Brian, the Doge in charge, and I am here with Aiden Paladin, and this is the Doge and Aiden show. I don't have a fancy intro for this yet uh, because I'm lazy, but <laughs> that doesn't mean that it won't be fun anyways. So uh, welcome, Aiden, and welcome to Honey Badger Radio once again. Hey, thanks for having me as always. Oh, yeah. Awesome. So um, we're going to be talking about something that uh, Aiden t turned me on to, but I found really interesting. And I've actually thought about this a lot, but I didn't know it was a phenomenon that, uh, you know, sort of was becoming a discussion. So to uh, let, let me, I, I'm going to let you, Aiden, if you could explain to everyone what we're talking about and then any sort of, uh, you know, uh, disclaimers before we get into it. Sure. So uh, this is some new research that was published um, last quarter. Well, when it actually came out in the physical publication, it's, it's fairly new research, though, that gives some new support to something called spiral of silence theory. Spiral science theory was introduced in 1974 by Dr. Noel Norman. And essentially what it says is that there's two um, competing forces. We have willingness to speak and fear of social isolation. And then we have this thing called public opinion. Now, your willingness to speak about a certain topic is based on the interaction between your willingness or, or based between the interaction and this willingness to speak and fear of social isolation as it relates to general public opinion. What that means in layman's terms is that if we think that the general uh, cultural milieu is such that our opinion will be disregarded or castigated or demonized by people, including our friends, well, based on our own personal propensity or proclivities uh, of fear to being isolated and alone, we're going to have less and less desire to speak. What this means culturally and uh, long term is that people who have dissenting opinions are often the most silent. At least that's the theory. The problem is that with the theory is that even though it, it's kind of after it, it was proposed, we sort of just took it as a given. Of, of course, that's how things work, obviously. But there's a lot of criticisms, including that there hasn't been a ton of empirical support for it, and also that there could be other reasons outside of um, social isolation and willingness to speak that prevent people from talking, such as being polite, not wanting to mess up friendships. It's more than maybe just that. But I like this research that um, I recently came across okay. because uh, it actually provides us with a model. Okay, so when you say uh, there isn't a lot of empirical evidence, uh, is it just because it's so new that there there haven't been any uh, you know really great studies done, or is that like um, despite this this current paper that we're looking at? Oh no, it's from the seventies. It's been around for a while. There's ah. tons of evidence, but it, it constantly gets gets criticized. It's it's one of those theories um, in social science where people are are constantly debating whether or not it, it's even a thing or if it's something else going on. It just that's why I just get excited to see it uh, that there's still some some pretty good uh, evidence being collected to support it because but but you know to, to explain how it actually works that there is this mediator factor of the fear of isolation which is actually what this study found and another thing to point out about this study as well if you look at the title reluctance to talk about politics in face-to-face -face and Facebook settings, examining the impact of fear and of fear of isolation, willingness to self-center, and peer network characteristics. And then it says that they're looking at a 2016 election. You mm. might be really quick to think this is about the U.S. 2016 election. It's not. It's about an election in China. And it's 800 Chinese participants. So uh, keep that in mind, that this is... Uh, which we have found some cultural differences there potentially in the extant data that I've seen. This is interesting though, because if you go down to like page eight, you'll see their general model and it was more or less supported. So 
uh, just just some cool stuff to kind of uh, look at the also differences between online versus offline. Uh, some general things to keep in mind, and I think we can talk about. So, for example, Brian, would you say that people are more willing to share volatile political opinions online? that off hmm well you know <clears throat> i found that there was that when i first thought about this i thought it was a little bit paradoxical uh because you know there is the argument that people are more likely to be trolly and, and offensive and uh and edgy online because of anonymity but i also find that it's true that people who are like for example if they have family if they're on a, a a network a social media network where they have you know irl friends and family members they're they could be more most like more likely to censor themselves like me personally um i'm pretty i'm pretty uh edgy on on facebook and so mm -hmm. i don't i don't share uh, what i do is i'm i'm pretty edgy on facebook so i don't friend a lot of my family members that request mm -hmm. it like my own mother still has a pending friend request for me on facebook <laughs> i won't add her because i don't want her to see the shit that i post so um I guess I think that people are less likely in general to be to share really um, what you could say politically charged or politically divisive. Obviously, divisive isn't the word for it. Politically unpopular things. Yeah. That's I'll put it that way. Point. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good way to say it. Um, I would say less likely. Yeah. Right. And, and it turns out that they basically supported the spiral of science, uh, silence theory in that that was the case um it was a mediation effect of willingness to self-censor so we mm -hmm. all like nobody wants to be socially isolated but that's something that we can have in greater or lesser degrees some people are more trolly and they don't care about being a little bit more socially isolated yeah but it went through this other thing this willingness to self-censor censor as a mediator factor so just not wanting to be socially isolated has to come in tandem with also being willing to censor yourself. Um, in addition, this was most observable in, let's see, the, the actual quote, okay. So uh, the contingent conditions of higher disagreement, lower network heterogeneity led to less expression. So the uh, less diverse, the, the people that you hang out with on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. The less diverse, Actually, the less likely were people were to um, express themselves. So the less diverse, like you, when right. we say that, we mean like racially, gender, that kind of thing. Uh, diversity of opinion. Oh, so, the less diverse the opinion. Yeah, sure. Yes. The less likely people were to um, go sort of go against the grain or rock the boat, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. But interestingly, this was kind of reversed in face to face, and the researchers. Uh, suggested or proposed that the reason that would be is because um, the more heterogeneous, that means like the, the greater diversity of opinion that there is online, the more people, the less likely people are to censor themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Because you think, oh, there's a greater diversity of opinion, so I can express mine. Face to face, the greater the heterogeneity of opinions, meaning the greater the diversity, they might, we might be confused about where our boundary limits are okay. And as such, they actually found that in face-to-face -face communication environments, people were less likely, or excuse me, they were more likely to suppress their own opinions when there was a greater diversity of opinion. Yeah. They were more likely to suppress their own. That's just a really interesting finding, huh. um, particularly of the internet. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a neat thing. Yeah, that no, that is that's that's quite interesting. Let me let me ask uh, the uh, the you guys watching also, you know, hit the like button. It does a lot for our um, analytics, and, and we want to make sure that uh, everyone who's sub to HBR is also watching. So yeah, hit the like button for us. But let me ask you guys this: if you if you are on any form of uh, social media, and I know that you're at least on one because here you are on YouTube, <laughs> are you more likely? First of all, are you using your actual like name? You know, because I think uh, if you're in a space like YouTube or Twitter, you can, um, you know, hide your uh, identity. But in places where you don't, like Facebook, for example, are you more, do you feel like there, um, you have to suppress your opinions so that you don't upset people? I've noticed that I get a lot of people who add me on Facebook because they know me from this, from Honey Badger Radio. And about half of them are not using their real name. 
And they have, like, mm-hmm. joke names. Like, you know, there was one guy, I think I just, he just tried to add me the other day. His name was uh, Gazdek Ikes. And um, I, <laughs> so it was like a joke name, you know, Gazdek Ikes. So I didn't, uh, I, I haven't responded yet because sure I don't that's know. that's not him. his real name? No, his name is Gazdek <laughs> Ikes. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that's not real. So but, it's his Christian name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's his uh, that's his original African name, not his slave <laughs> name. But but anyway, so you know, if you use your real name, do you um, tend to suppress your own opinions? And also, do you suspect? And I do. I know this for sure. Do you suspect that there are people in your friends network who are people you know in real life that you've spoken to, and they've told you their views on stuff, but on social media they're very silent about it. Or even they they um, they sort of virtue signal in the opposite direction because they don't want to upset people. Mainly because they they because in, in my case um, I used to be friends with uh, my boss, you know, and so I people at my work, so I wouldn't talk about what I believed because I didn't want to oh, get fired, right? That's why I so, stopped using Facebook personally. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't do that. Now I just don't add anybody that I work with. I just, I just don't. <laughs> so, there you go. Uh, there was too many people. My Facebook was half. It, it was my entire university. So I was like, I can't say anything on here. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just, I just, I just, I just, I just pissed off my, uh, my, my, because I'm still friends with a lot of uh, people who I went to school with. And the funny thing is, is that because I remain vocal, I do get one or two people who have messaged me in private, and they are just like. I can't say this out loud, but I agree with everything you're saying. I just don't want to lose mm-hmm. my friends. And that's one of the reasons why I found this topic so interesting was because mm-hmm. I am seeing exactly. that phenomenon, you know? I mean, I, I think obviously the, and I, I think I've mentioned this theory before, but it is the, the case study of Donald Trump mm-hmm. when, you know, all these um, polling companies went out and, we're trying to collect data on the 2016 election and they went, you know, look, nobody supports Donald Trump. Well, <laughs> there's a, a sort of a, a certain element in data collection, mm-hmm. which is a pro-social behavior. You don't want to go against the grain. And also you will oftentimes capitulate to what you think the researcher wants you to say. This is These are normal research effects. There are ways to control for them through statistical analysis. But the fact of the matter is some participants, and in fact, when we're talking about looking at the spiral of silence theory, many participants, perhaps if they feel that their opinions are so um, unpopular, will keep into themselves, even in an anonymous survey. Mm. You know, that that in and of itself is interesting, but that's what I think we found with Trump, where they the polls were saying, you know, 99% chance Hillary will win. No one likes Trump. And then it turns out, you know, a lot of people like Trump. I mean, also, it's well. This was like the rallies CNN, were evident, but <laughs> yeah, these were the CNN polls or something, or or the ones they were using. They were citing. I was just and thinking, it's yeah, and it's if you're taking a poll for CNN, yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking like they could be polling their own people, so it's not they're not true. really getting like a a fair sampling. But it, and I think this is this is the thing too, guys. I, I think this is relevant and important because what. What we talk about on HBR mainly, right, is is men's issues, right? Men's MRA stuff, and mm-hmm. MRA stuff is is probably one of the most unpopular things to talk about I've ever come across. And I'm serious. Right. What I, I mean, I take it as far as to say that a lot of like anti uh, SJW people who make content don't want to talk about MRA stuff, or they they stay away from some of the um, they stay away from some of our talking points. Like, for example, last last Friday, one of the reasons why this show is happening today and not on Friday, Aiden, is because I had David Jaffe on Friday, and it was the only day oh, yeah. he was available. And Jaffe is, um, he's basically a normie video game developer, right? He's the guy who made God of War and Twisted Metal mm-hmm. and stuff. And he, I was talking to him, and he basically, you know, in his conversation, he's like, I, I'm a feminist. Like, he basically just comes out and says it, you know, and, and he, uh, he believes that he's a liberal guy with liberal values and blah, blah, blah. And so, the, the, but he positioned himself intentionally as opposed to men's issues or men's rights activists. But it's not because he knows anything about it. It's because the, the feminist position is a default position. And... The, anything that, that goes outside of that, whether it's 
full on like you know the MRA talking points that I subscribe to, which there are things like feminism was never good ever in history. Women were never oppressed, at least not as a gender on their own. You know, it was never about that. And these kinds of things, if you like brought that up with a guy like Jaffe, his head would explode because he'd never, right. that's just going way too he'd far. never heard it. No, this is like a beyond the pale, you know, uh, discussion for people like that. And, and that's why I didn't, I didn't fight him that hard. I just wanted to know where he stood on things and I just talked to him. So when you, um, what we're ultimately talking about is, a person's willingness to speak out about things they care about and what could be holding them back. And I think that this is um, a really good example of, of what we're talking about here, right? So that's why I thought right. this was a good thing to talk about. Another interesting thing about it is that if we follow the sort of a proposal of spiral of silence theory, it would s suggest that we'll never reach a change in public opinion unless people speak out. But it's this spiral effect again, where you feel as if your opinion is radical, so you don't share it. And because you don't share it, the opinion becomes less or the, the opinion, the, the data, whatever it is, becomes less and less uh, seen and essentially becomes invisible until there is no escaping from for certain there's no escape for certain opinions or positions from the bottom of this spiral of obscurity. That's the fear. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly, though, according to this data, online, we do see positive outcomes here, right? That when we get a couple of more diversities of opinion, um, and what we know, at least about uh, de-individuation theory and disinhibition, is that people are more likely to speak their mind online. But uh, Facebook is, a, is again, a unique environment because you use your real name, typically. Yeah. So Still, it's, though, it's, people it, were a bit more likely to, to share in, in across both homogeneous and heterogeneous environments online as it goes through this um, this model fit uh, through the it actually they didn't they did not uh, support H1, I believe, uh, their first hypothesis. If you look at the the model, they only supported uh, H2 to H3, which is the uh, mediation model fit. So. You have oh, yeah. to both fear social isolation and be willing to censor yourself in order for this to have an effect. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not ubiquitous. Um, not everyone is affected by the spiral of silence equally. This is, again, interesting support and clarification for the spiral of silence theory in that some people will just tell you what the hell they think no matter what, which is great. But mm -hmm. uh, And online, it's particularly of import because according to these data, the more heterogeneous so the more diverse the opinions you see online the more likely you are even if you have this willingness to self-censor and this fear of social isolation to share your opinion but again we didn't find that um offline in fact it was the reverse where the heterogeneity the diversity of opinions like scared or confused people because then they didn't know what they were supposed to say essentially uh with at least what the authors suggest Hmm. That's po yeah, it's entirely possible. It's like uh, when people are asked, especially if they're put in like an interview setting and they're asked about their opinions on something, they treat it less like an interview and more like a quiz show where they're trying to figure out what the right answer is supposed to be. And uh, that that could be – and I'm, 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 we're talking about like normies here, you know, like, mm -hmm. like the average person, not not uh, people like us. Um, and so what, what are the – well, let's look at the – uh, the stuff from this other this other survey does it does it tie in or this this uh, other article? It, it does. It, it yeah. does uh, uh, just from an interesting sort of way. But okay. I, I just as a as a to follow up and, and finish up on this study and what I think you were getting at. But just to clarify. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll go back. Oh yeah, is that we can't be silent? That it actually, according to these data, talking about something, even if it's hard, even if people will shit on you for it. If people see a greater heterogeneity of ideas, of diversity of opinions online regarding things like men's rights advocacy or activism, that means ultimately that they might be more willing to speak up about it because the effects of the spiral of silence are lessened even according to this model. That's why, it, mm. if you sometimes think like, we're just like bullshitting on YouTube, this data actually indicates that there's, there might be some importance to 
just saying what you think. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely, because, well, I mean, isn't that how you also could conceivably, like, shift away from this uh, anxiety around not saying anything because you don't want to, you know, because you believe that your position is so unpopular. I think that's part of it, too, right? Like, you, if you... Right, then you go up the spiral. Yeah, then you start to climb up the spiral. (laughs) Exactly, and you get more people to do it. And I know, because I I have, like, um, you know, I have friends that I talk to in you know uh, in in person and i i'm trying to get them to see that my positions and they and they agree with my positions you know at least they're 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 open to them in such a way that they're like i he has a point but it there's still a lot of fear around actually like being more vocal in the presence of like the places like facebook where you know these a lot of times this and i'm not saying that the, facebook is the battlefield of the future but it is a good and fast way to share ideas and get things out there just like twitter and youtube and other things and that's where right. people that i know exist right they're not following me on twitter i don't even use twitter that much and um i, I guess if we want to climb up the spiral we have to encourage people to see that the views that are being put out there that are not the mainstream are also not completely insane. They're actually, you know, relatively sane. Like, uh, I was talking to you before we did this, this, uh, show. And one of the things I, I was, I mentioned to you as I, I was proposing was this whole Norm Macdonald thing, right? Mm-hmm. Do you know the Norm Macdonald thing? What happened with him? I, I got the, the like quick and dirty, but probably, uh, Give me your take on it because you always yeah, hear. Yeah, I'll just make it. Things. Yeah, basically the short version is uh, Norm McDonald. For those of you guys who don't know, he's a stand-up comedian. He used to be on Saturday Night Live back in the day, and uh, he's always been like, you know, pretty like pro-free speech. Like, he doesn't give a fuck mm-hmm. what people think. You know, um, he just doesn't give a fuck. Right? He's at the point now where he's too old to give a shit about anybody's opinions. He like literally like, you know, goes to things wearing sweatpants and shit, and. He recently, and I don't know the exact words, but he recently like made some Twitter posts where he basically criticized the Me Too movement for going too far and specifically targeting people that he was friends with, like Roseanne Barr and this other guy whose name I can't remember. He was like, uh, he's like a host of some show, but like some other dude who's a friend. And these are people he knows personally, right? And Mm -hmm. he was outspoken. And then there was a social backlash or like even a professional backlash in that Jimmy Fallon refused to bring him on or could not bring him on the show because he criticized the Me Too movement. And it actually, Jimmy Fallon even said that supposedly people on his staff were crying because of Norm McDonald's comments about the Me Too movement. That it had gone too far. Well, they're just emulating Jimmy Fallon. Yeah, yeah. There's, well, it's not Jimmy Fallon's not the one that cries. That's uh, that's uh, yeah, that's the sorry, other guy. That's the other one. <laughs> <laughs> they, they all blend together, guys. They just blend together. But it, it does all. Yeah, become just a milieu, just gray. Mm-hmm. And blend. so and and so Norm McDonald was socially ostracized in that he wasn't allowed to make the appearance on the Tonight Show that he was supposed to make, and so. There were consequences for that. And then I think it was like the following morning, um, The View ugh, had had <laughs> Norm MacDonald on to essentially get him. They say, you know, they wanted to hear his side of the story, but it really wasn't that. They wanted to bring him on as sort of like um, to make a public, um, ber- a berate him publicly, make him the butt of their jokes, you know, and, and sort of like, make an example out of him for everyone else to like not go outside of the of the box right and he it it looks like he caved i I would say this this isn't that important but it looks like he caves on it but he does what he's what i think he's actually doing is he's showing people how bad it is okay by saying i hope i didn't offend you guys with any like he was super timid which is way outside of his character the entire time he was on and he explained how, you know, uh, none of that should have happened. And he even made, like, again, I think that he's being very subtle because he's not stupid. He makes this comment that he says, um, nothing is acceptable. But he just says it not, non-ironically, not as a joke, right? Mm-hmm. He says, oh, my, my publisher asked me what's acceptable. And I said, or what's over the line? And I was like, everything is over the line, all of it, you know? And 
he was making a point though and he was trying to make people see how bad it's gotten because he's a guy who's never he's never done anything he's not been accused of any sexual misconduct or sexual assault he just had an opinion about the me too movement just he had dared an, to have an yeah, opinion and he had an opinion about roseanne barr and how he thought that they went too far and it it was still enough to get him removed from the tonight show and then he got brought back on the view where he basically had to grovel to get to get um, back into their good graces, and then after that, they plugged his show. And even even uh, let then, let me tell you what: never apologize to these people. No, 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 never apologize. <laughs> it does but, not work. Who who was who was it? Vox Days original thing, I think. But uh, I'm not sure who coined that. Don't apologize to SJWs thing. But, well, that uh, goes way back to like yeah. GamerGate's beginnings. I think when I started mm -hmm. hearing about it, but. But yeah, but 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 you see, I'm using that as a microcosm for what we're talking mm -hmm. about. So there was the the view was expressing and Jimmy Fallon and all of Hollywood were basically saying you are not allowed to criticize the Me Too movement. It is a bar none objectively good thing. And by criticizing the Me Too movement and saying that people like um the some of the people who have been accused that don't deserve it, you know, or at least don't deserve um, it to last to follow them for the rest of their lives, like Louis C.K., for example. You know, there has to be a point where he can go back and do stand up again, right? To have that opinion is um, is the same as blaming the victims, and you, you're not allowed to do it. And that is essentially creating this kind of um, this climate of conform or else, which is making people afraid to express their real opinions because they can get to you even if you're online it's not even a you know norm mcdonald tweeted this out so this is a social media mm -hmm. uh, interaction right so this is right. what we're talking about right and um you know what um the interesting thing again about these data what they would indicate is that if twitter was let's say not completely biased and didn't you know block or ban mm -hmm. or remove mm -hmm. certain opinions then you would have a greater heterogeneity of opinion. And then according to these data, you might have more people willing to speak their their minds. That yeah. ends up in a spiral, not of silence, but of speaking. So uh, it is obvious then why some people want to stifle free speech, because particularly online, although not, not offline, interestingly enough, but particularly online, it seems that the more people are talking about something, the more others feel comfortable talking about it as well. Uh, yeah, and then of course it's no wonder we want to make sure that we stifle voices like Norm Macdonald or anybody from Twitter who who dares criticize the cultural norms. Mm -hmm. If you raise even an opinion that is contrary, and, and and by the way, when it is stifled like that. Of course, it only emphasizes and encourages the spiral of silence, being that, oh, look what will happen if I say something. But we, we have to. It won't change if we don't. We can't approach that heterogeneity that will you know, allow other people, even though it's more afraid to talk, if we don't. People have to talk about this stuff. They have to get the information, the data, the statistics. It has to come out there because if... And, and, and you know what? It will mean that some people will suffer. Some people will get put through the ringer on that unfortunately yeah but, well um, th th there's definitely i mean like i don't know if i'm gonna be able to find a regular job after doing this for same. as long as i have <laughs> and but but i mean i mean maybe but my name's been out there since the beginning but like it's interesting that you mentioned uh going against cultural norms and one of the things no pun intended norm but one of the things <laughs> that um also comes to mind is if Silicon Valley and the people who operate social media, because people on Facebook get zucked, people on, yeah. on Twitter get shadow banned and, uh, and removed, people on YouTube you get it demonetized. If it's zucked, yeah, or, it's jacked. Yeah, it's jacked. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, they get jacked. Um, but if, if these things are happening, when people are more prone to go against the norm, are, is it actually still the norm? Because they, it gets it gets engineered. Like it's like they're they're kind of engineering what the Overton window is supposed to um, you know be showing us. It's basically saying th these opinions are allowed, these are not. And what it does is it engineers the information that people get, which you can do if you are you know the the one of the few companies that control the way we talk to each other online. 
but you can't do it so easily out in public. And one of the reasons for that also is um, Silicon Valley doesn't control public discourse yet. And so unless we get the same kind of people who work in Silicon Valley or in the entertainment industry or in academia or in Hollywood, if we get them in positions of institutional power and political power where they can, I guess, at least try to uh, control our speech beyond that, you know? Right. And I, I sent you an image that um, it might be useful to put up on screen just to illustrate to the audience real quickly about yeah. how the spiral works in terms of having to breach that public opinion um, barrier. Popped it in. Yeah, that should help. Uh, I think to show like when we're trying to appre uh, approach that. Now, the Silicon Valley guys, they don't want us to approach that. They don't want us to approach that public opinion normative, right? And as such, they want us down there in the silence, the fear of isolation at the very bottom of the spiral. So, you know, the way to do that in, in part is to ensure that you don't see it. For example, I was shadow banned. Were you shadow banned before Jack interestingly went to go talk to Congress? Uh, you know what? I don't, I don't, I don't think so, but I don't know. I haven't used my, uh, I hadn't used my Twitter in a while except to reach out to people. So I, I only I... got caught. I was contacted by several people, um, that said, Hey, Aiden, did you know that you were shadow banned? No. Well, now I do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was, it was tons of people. It was people I know who, who don't even involve themselves with politics at all, who, well, who tertiarily involve themselves with politics. So um, someone like my friend Ritualist, who I play uh, Pathfinder with, who doesn't post political stuff, but he's friends with me and Dr. Lehman and a couple other people who uh -huh. post more political things. So guess what? He ends up on a shadow ban list too. You can't even be secondarily re removed from political people who share opinions that might not be... Oh, by the way, Layman is, is banned from Twitter right now for having some bants back and forth with Dankula. Completely friendly stuff. Oh, brother. They were joking with each other and he got banned from Twitter. Well, suspended, but I think it's like a... Well, I, I, I guess good looking out for Dankula now. Uh, okay, thanks, Jack. Well, now Dankula's <laughs> trying to help Layman of being like, come on, we're just having some jokes. Um, it's ridiculous, but the point is, the more that they hide your opinions that are that are subversive or to to the the you know uh, predominant gestalt then the more that that gestalt remains the predominant gestalt right mm -hmm. uh as such it, it's a very uh easy i suppose method in in the current age of of opinion control not yeah. just not because people don't have other opinions they do it doesn't mean that the number of people with the opinion changes necessarily from, you know, were this not the case, but their willingness to speak out about it is less and therefore the information is less available and therefore new people um, are less likely to gain that information. That's the fear and, and problem with the, the spiral of silence is we need to reach that prevailing public opinion in order for everyone to feel comfortable. Oh, I have a, a really quick um, yeah, go ahead. case study, case study. So for example, I just saw this tweet yesterday or the day before. Um, Asterios Kokonos is a comedian from New York. I, I don't know if you guys know of him, Asterios Kokonos. He was involved in the $20 million lawsuit that Maddox, the internet's first- Oh yeah, Maddox, yeah, Levied yeah. against him and about 10 other people, including mm -hmm. Dick Masterson and and Patreon, among other things, and people and organizations. And Asterios Kokonos uh, is, is a very left-leaning left -leaning person, but comedians were silent when he got uh, attacked under this, this lawsuit, which accused him of many things, including online harassment, sexism, you know, all of the, the insert insult to white man here, whatever yeah. kind of stuff. And uh, it was all thrown out, more or less. And Asterios has a, I was just listening to Nick Riqueda, Riqueda, I always pronounce his name wrong, just last night talking about some new um, happenings in the case. Uh-huh. The interesting thing, though, is that all of a sudden, as soon as the case is thrown out, completely, it is absolutely thrown out at this point, all of these comedians suddenly feel very secure and saying like, hey, uh, how you doing, Asterios? I uh -huh. always supported you. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So basically, it's like the coast is clear. I think I'm going to come out and right. support the guy. But they but they wanted to, or maybe they were waiting to see what the results were, and then that mm-hmm. would determine their opinion um, about it. So, and, and when you, it's funny because if you put that in the light, in, in the light of the Me Too movement, where um, women are making, and it's mostly women doing this, that are mm-hmm. making accusations of sexual misconduct, or sexual assault, or sexual impropriety, whatever, against these prominent male figures, it, I think that the, um, the degree to which people believe or support them obviously comes down to how many accusations there are. Um, and that will determine how other celebrities or folks that are traveling in those circles and have friends there and so on, or even like business connections that they want to uh, maintain mm-hmm. will react. So, um, you know, again, going back to the norm thing, he said on The View, if, if somebody gets like 50 women coming forward um, claiming that he did something, then he must be guilty. And he's just going by the numbers. I think he's wrong. Um, because I don't care if it's a million women there, if there's no evidence, we need to see evidence because it's easy to get people yes. coordinated <laughs> on somebody like that. Look at Gian Gomeshi for more. But, um, there, there is this, I think, you know, the more, the more likelihood there is that something might be true and damning, the more likely people are to stay silent. Um, without, without, and not questioning it, even though there's nothing that is definite, even though you could know the person, be friends with them. You don't want to, um, you don't want to lose friends. You don't want to become isolated. And maybe the more like you depend on social media for your friendships, the more likely you're do that you are to do that too. Like, I think that people who, Mm. um, are, you know, they, they're more secure with their, uh, IRL friends and they don't care about internet friendships they may be more likely to speak out. I don't know. It's just something I was throwing out there. Again, there's traits involved in this too, meaning that some people just care more than others, but um, which is the case with like everything in social science that some yeah. people are just, we're all, we're the same and that we're all different. A, a little bit, just a little, uh, <laughs> a little, a little bit different. In, in that must be where, that yeah, that must be where the social sciences and psychology kind of probably have a little bit of overlap, right? Because oh, you have to well, know social, people Psychology is a social you... science. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, like, everyone has the same general things. And nobody wants to be isolated, mm-hmm. generally speaking. But we might have more or less concern with that. That's exactly what the trait is of, of fear of isolation. Just like willingness to speak out is a trait, like, um, variable. And that some people don't care. Mm-hmm. Some people do more. And and that that those are individual variables. Um, that we can account for and put into a model as we, we did in the study we looked at. Um, and that's, that's the interesting thing about it. But yeah, it all goes into psychology, of course. People have general traits, but to greater or lesser degrees across individuals. You can still condense them down to aggregates. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a question for you guys watching, and also I'll ask you this too, Aiden. Um, mm-hmm. do, you, do you know people online who you know in real life that um, you think, let's say, uh, you know for sure have opinions that they don't express online, but they will express to you in private? I have and- to, you know, I, I haven't had real life friends <laughs> in such a long No, 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 that sounds really depressing. Press F for like- Aiden's relationships. <laughs> um, I, oh, my, my last? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, after college, y- y'all spread apart. You yeah. go back or to, to where you came from or something like that. And uh, my last really good IRL friend uh, got very mad over the the election. She decided to... And I do say decided because of... It was all very fast and I, I, I didn't quite buy it. Decided mm-hmm. to become non-binary, transgender, but not transitioning. And third gender astral kin also... Uh, Hillary Clinton supporter thinks Donald Trump's going to put everybody in a camp. Yeah, it's it was pretty bad. It was bad. I couldn't do anything with that. I, I just couldn't. I, as much as I tried to, I couldn't do anything with it. Oh. And um, so Trump winning the election literally changed somebody's gender. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. It, well, for her. Well, no. I mean, Who she needs hormone that, like, blockers? <laughs> yeah. I, oof. Again, it was like I was trying to be like, let's think about things rationally. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm I'm in the I'm I'm in no, I'm syndrome. non-binary but, now. It, it's Take interesting that, though. Blump. It's interesting though. <laughs> to go to the other study I gave you though today, because this uh-huh. this is a good segue, right? She started getting all of her information from Facebook. So since we were already talking about how much we're likely to communicate on Facebook uh, about our, our uh, different opinions with this sort of wh- what we generally call Facebook is or what I would call Facebook is a pseudonymous or pseudo anonymous in that you can be a little bit more anonymous on Facebook but generally it is related to your identity but it, because it's on the internet mm-hmm. and you're not face to face facing someone seeing their um, physiological responses and their body language it has some of the same effects of de-individuation and anonymity uh, towards our behavior because yeah, there's no get some of these different things yeah but, like but. in facebook because it's like yeah you're you're usually using your real name and face but you're still disconnected enough you're not like right in front of somebody so mm-hmm. it's like the ultimate consequence or at least the average ultimate consequence for saying something people don't like is that they did they they make a uh, you know loud proclamation on your thread, calling you a bunch of names, and then they unfriend you. Like ba- that's right. like, that's like the worst thing, right? Um, most of the time, right. and then it's people there just it's not like, yeah, it's, it's there like forever. a conversation where they can say sorry. Right, you can go back right. and look at that thing. Or they know? just usually what what happens to me is people secretly unfriend me, and then they just stop talking to me, mm-hmm. and then I don't yeah. notice for a long time. It's like oh, that person unfriended me. Hmm. <laughs> okay. You know, it's just, all right, whatever. But, yeah, that's uh, that's usually the worst thing. Although I think that that kind of stuff, like getting unfriended, like a lot of people do, they feel like a real, it, it almost feels like a breakup for It's for catharsis people. for some people. Yeah. I think it's catharsis or it's, it's it, yeah, it has very real effects. This is a whole, oh, my God. This is, a, that, the idea of how de-individuation or um, pseudo-de-individuation, pseudo-disinhibition, or, and the disinhibition that, results from it is an entire field of study so that's like its whole thing Mm -hmm. but uh generally speaking yeah facebook's a little bit different from real life we're and and the data that we looked at earlier supported that that even though our real names attached to it we have a little bit more leeway face to face probably not so much because it's it's too attached to you uh too long term however as i was saying about my online friends who all came to start getting their information from Facebook. And this is really interesting. Also going back to talking about how um, we tend to use social media as a news source. We, we go to Twitter yeah. or to Facebook. And, and I mean, not just official news sources, but also unofficial ones, people's people saying things because the other study uh, that I sent you is I think published in the exact same article or the, the, the same um, journal uh it might have been the next quarter. I don't remember as the as the one that we looked at first. The uh, uh, it's is there a way to uh, know Kashiatore. by looking? Yeah, the Kashiatore at all 2018 piece. Uh, this is a... you... oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What do you want it's me the to other do? one. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I got it up here. Is Facebook making us Go dumber? Ahead. Exploring social media as a predictor of use as a predictor of political knowledge. Yes. Is Facebook actually making us dumber? Um, that's that's a good question, right? Mm-hmm. Because it seems that so many people, the spiral of silence would say the more people talk about stuff, the greater minority opinions are going to be heard. And that study that we looked at was specifically addressing Facebook. So is this one. And this one finds something fairly interesting. Um, do you have it? Uh, let's see. Uh, yes. Scroll down to page um, 14 on table four. All right. Hold on. There it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> Re- regression predicting political knowledge among social media users. Yeah, this is this is the really um. Uh, yeah, this is this is the 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 nasty finding. If you uh, look down under uh, model four, so the the fourth uh, row or the the fourth uh, column, you'll see a mm-hmm. uh, block four types of social media use: news consumption, news sharing. Uh, Point negative or negative point one five related to news consumption, and point negative uh, point zero seven of news sharing. Uh, the point uh, one five is at the level of uh, p is less than point zero zero one, which is a 
there's no that's not an accident that is a very very strong it's not a strong correlation but that didn't happen by accident the other one happens at 0.05 uh which is typical generally we require all research if it's less than if it is greater than 0.05 it's not it shouldn't be published or it will not be with a star because that means it's um not statistically significant yeah so what this wait so, that so the, what are these what do these uh decimals mean these really uh, really scroll low down numbers a little bit on Negative? the screen i i was it, like not... down at the bottom where it says uh pew data n equals 840 oh uh, I no see just it. uh just on the screen because it will show up on the yeah, yeah yeah oh then now now it's working okay there it is i was at the uh looking at the youtube video okay yeah where it says uh yeah block four types of social media use yeah i got it Except yeah. for block four, you, which are before entry standardized regression of coefficients. And then what, it has some yeah. stuff there. What that just means, what what, what that data right there mean are is that um, the more so more news that you consume on on Facebook and the more that you talk about news on Facebook and share it, the less informed you are on basic topics of politics. Really? Yep. Whoa. Now, what? What? Why is this? Like, what? How do you figure this out? Because if people are sharing more so, news, more, or is it just if people are sharing more news, you, more news? Sorry. Then um, maybe I meant to say news. I don't know who's behind it all. But <laughs> but uh, no, if people are sharing more news on Facebook, and yet they are less informed on politics, then what? What? How do we square that circle? So these data were collected from two different data sets. One was from theirs, which is um, uh, J GFK data set. What, what would that stand for again? It's their, their independently collected data. It's the uh, um, Nationally Representative Online Survey of U.S. adults aged 18 years or older. It was um, it, the, the final result was 2,800 participants, more or less. Um, of people who actually finished the response. And in addition to that, or in tandem, they used Pew data. The, their data, the GFK data set on political knowledge, all they say about it was measured through a series of multiple choice items dealing with a respondent's knowledge of the political, major political parties, excuse me, governmental positions and the rules of the political process. Uh, they also cite a source where that's coming from, from 1996. So I assume that is not overwhelmingly skewed, although it might be. The Pew data set did not exclusively pertain to politics. They uh, represent a measure of political affairs information and other uh, current topics through media. That's the Pew data set. But they combined those two into this um, uh, collaborative uh, data analysis. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that, yep, of a correlation, there was a negative relationship between the amount of time that you spent consuming news or the amount that you consumed news and shared news on social media towards actually understanding, again, these basic things about like political parties uh, and politicians. Right. Okay. Which so is, is weird in terms of how that works out. I think that it's because people who probably spend a lot of time talking and, and reading and sharing might be a bit partisan. So. Uh huh they get involved in kind of echo chambers that aren't necessarily representative of reality. Yeah, right, right. And and also a lot of times maybe people who share more often or more frequently are spending less time actually reading what they're sharing and maybe they're sharing based on a viral video or um, a headline or again, it's like traveling in their bubble or what have you. So again, th it, it's... interestingly though, the, the mm -hmm. consumption reading more is almost double that of sharing. That's very bizarre uh, in terms of, uh, of a negative relationship. So, so people are I, wait, I think people that are reading or, more, or the people who are reading more know less. Oh, okay, okay. They actually know even less than people who share. Mm -hmm. Interesting. They're, Just, they're... It's a weird finding, and it's interesting to find it. I think in the same public, the same uh, uh, version of this journal as mm -hmm. that other study. Oh, huh. yeah, that is really interesting. I'm still trying to figure out how is it because, OK, so we're looking at a correlation, though, not mm -hmm. necessarily a link or no, a no, causal, causal link. No, it's just these... it's just it just so happens that this results in this. And um, yeah, I'm trying to or think this I is mean... negatively related to that. Mm -hmm. We don't know what causes it. It just again, my my thought would be that. If you're reading a lot of Facebook news, it's probably a lot of 
BS. Yeah, a lot of now and this and ATTN and BuzzFeed videos. And therefore <laughs> your knowledge of actual politics is, it's a negative, it's negatively correlated. Yeah. yeah. That would be my guess. So well, but it could be that the, say, the, the viral content that travels around Facebook is just BS. And people have a, because it's viral, people are more likely to share it. Because it's right. everywhere. So I mean, we can I, say, I mean, hey, it's good, to, it's good to share things, uh, share unpopular opinions, because it can help people. But an overuse only of social media news might not be good for actual understanding in total. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's all that means. I, I think I, that, that I, would be my takeaway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's really interesting. I wonder then if if that means that people who are more likely to share um, animals and predicaments links or uh, world star hip hop links are more politically woke <laughs> than mm-hmm. people who yeah. share news. <laughs> uh, I joke, but but uh, no, these are really interesting findings, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's very cool. So it this is this is to, to say, guys, this is why I think it's really important that we be more vocal. Maybe we can shift that tide of discussion. But I don't know. That's what I think. I I try to be vocal. Oh, you know, people consider that like there are people who I know who are who are friends of mine that tend to be you know um, really apolitical online, and they know me and they they comment saying, "Holy crap, you know, uh, Brian, you're always like." Uh, triggering people online or starting arguments so you're always you always have these hot takes on stuff and they it's almost like there's like they're impressed because i have like zero fucks you know on online and um and they're more like the types that don't want to it's not just that they don't want to um they that they want to go along with the mainstream belief system because they don't say anything political at all like it's not just people repeating the popular opinions, you know, like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, sharing women's marches and um, Trevor Noah's, you know, videos or whatever online. But it's people who don't say anything. All they do is post pictures of their kids or they post pictures of their pets or they just post things that are funny in a normy way. And then when I um, am, you know, uh, kind of, a, I guess, a politically, um, I don't know, deviant <laughs> they they uh they will message me and they'll say things like you know that that whoa you know like you're you're really trying to piss people off right and um and it's just not true but it's something that i i do find interesting because there are people who are uh, don't go against the grain but they also don't go with it they just kind of like stay out of it and i think it's when it tends to be women that do that uh, in my experience, it's almost all women actually that do that. I think men tend to be a little bit more outspoken, and I, the reason for That's it, I believe, typical. yeah, I think it's because that uh, you know women don't want to lose that social. Um, no, we're high. We're high in agreeableness. We we don't want mm-hmm. to um, rock the boat, so to speak. Um, not not most women. Uh, those who haven't been completely brainwashed and i will use that phrase (laughs) by uh, the feminist agenda that essentially says you have to be outspoken all the time every Mm -hmm. day because it is it is in many ways contradictory to the natural proclivities of it it is except that maybe and um, this is a little bit i know we're on a bit of a tangent but i think it's related um if those women believe that the feminist narrative is in fact the norm like it this is, is this is so speed right zero. Now, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, if to be vocal is going to get you, like, I think that women don't want to rock the boat, um, in general. But if they think that what they're saying is going to give them social kudos, then yeah. they will say it because they don't think it's rocking the boat. They think that it's doing what is right, and uh, that's sort of like you know that's not upsetting the boat. It's supposed to make everyone happy in it, and they're and they get sort of socially reinforced by, you know, other, um, you know, their friends who are feminists and the, the sort of like the uh, mainstream media who's telling them this is mainstream. So therefore it's not risky. Like none of these things, they'll, they'll tell right. them that they're being, you know, that they're kind of like doing this kind of punching up, you know, underdog, plucky, likable thing that is risky, but it is really isn't risky. So I think that women kind of inti- intuitively know that what they're doing isn't really going to put them in any danger, so they do it. And it, and they can feel like a rebel, uh, even though what they're doing is not actually rebellious. So, 
Yeah, absolutely. But because again, it's it's a from a safe position within the spiral of silence mm-hmm. sort of model. Like y- y- you are the prevailing public opinion. The prevailing public opinion. This is why it's of course it's so ridiculous that uh, the, the oppression Olympics stuff. It's that well, we're so oppressed. We're so oppressed. It's like, well, hang on. Your, um, you know, perspective on things is the mainstream. That's what we get from every media outlet. And 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 again, then going back to the second study about how. What are the media outlets that we see on Facebook and Twitter promoted everywhere? It's this kind of crap. It's this feminist agenda, um, Marxism, absolute, very, very specific political points, right? Mm-hmm. That, are, that are spread everywhere. So you kind of get, yeah, like as you said, you get this sort of interesting dichotomy or, or middle ground, I guess, more accurately, where you can feel like a rebel while absolutely following the mainstream. Yeah, but you you get to sort of pretend and have the have the um, pathos of that. Yeah, it's like know? knowing that what you're doing is you think that it's like um, uh, you know it's against the mainstream, but still main it's still popular enough that it's safe because it's not like mm-hmm. you know you 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 can't um, it it doesn't have any risk associated with like for the most part you're not going to be socially isolated you're not going to be excluded or shamed. There are no consequences. It's a sure thing. You're safe. But you still somehow convince yourself that what you're doing is rebellious and edgy when it really isn't. Interestingly, I think they're losing that. And I think Me Too is a perfect example because, I mean, what's her? Asia Argento? Asia Argento? Yeah, a perfect, ex- a perfect <laughs> you know, example mm. of... <laughs> get woke, go broke. Uh, you're yeah. gonna get called out for this stuff when you make everybody potentially um, a villain, so yeah. you can feel good under this kind of thing. Y- you might get caught under as well. So I think that also it now now we're kind of almost coming full circle of being like you cannot do this willy nilly anymore. You mm-hmm. you really can't because if you if you show your support for hashtag Me Too, and then it comes out that you're accused of some. Um, sexual misconduct, which everyone would be under its extremely broad umbrella of, yeah. you know, claims and and allegations. Everyone is guilty. Mm-hmm. So essentially, what we we end up with is I I think that people are starting to pull back because they're realizing well, then not only would I be a sexual offender, but I'm also a hypocrite now. So it makes it twice as bad, I guess. Yeah. So maybe people will start no, to people hate move hypocrites. Back on some that. people hate yeah. hypocrites. You know, some some uh, sometimes it seems like people hate hypocrites more than they hate criminals. <laughs> like, like uh, I'm right. serious. Like Norm Macdonald made a joke about this actually the other day, where he he said, uh, "What was it? Something about how someone was behaving." Uh, uh, I think it was about Asia Argento and how you know. Um, she is uh, being accused of, you know, like having sex with an underage boy and getting like his his like, nude photos. There was a leak that he was getting like that she was getting his nudes ever since he was twelve years old. Oh and, my god, I didn't know about that. Oh, you didn't know Holy about shit. that? We did a Breaking Bad on it. Yeah, th- this guy. No. Yeah, Jimmy Jeez. Bennett. No, Jimmy Bennett was sending her nudes of himself from the age of twelve, and she didn't tell anyone about it. And she, apparently, she still has them. And she didn't say anything to his parents. She didn't tell him that he needs to stop. She didn't. I mean, granted, if it's a twelve-year-old sending you pictures, you don't necessarily have to go to the cops, but you can go to the parents. You can go to somebody. You can do something. But she didn't do anything. She just kind of kept it quiet. And then when he turned seventeen, she admitted to having sex with him and all of this. And so, like, it came out. You know, all these things and. People were making a bigger deal out of the fact that Asia Argento was being a hypocrite than they were about her doing this with a twelve-year-old boy as as early as twelve. Right? And Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah he, it was and he made yeah, yeah, he, you are yeah and he made a joke and he was like, you know, um, <sighs> I think he said something like uh, uh, he made a joke saying something about how you know, well, you know, Louis C.K. may have sinned in front of these women, but at least he admitted it. I mean, whew, he could have been worse. He could have been a hypocrite about it. You know, and <laughs> and it, that's the funny thing, you know, and but yeah, it's true. So going back to and I think that the reason why people do take the 
the the the fear of being seen as a hypocrite seriously is because we do take it seriously because we don't like it when people lie or pretend to be something they're not and then the social isolation that comes out of it um i think people fear because you know when it comes to breaking the law we have due process but when it comes to being labeled a hypocrite mm -hmm. people just decide whether you are or not you know so and it's very easy for people to fall into hypocrisy territory it's very yep. easy Yep. I, and again, I think that that informs a lot of of all of this. That's why people are moving away from me, too, because they're mm -hmm. afraid to be they're more afraid to be labeled a hypocrite at this point, maybe even than to uh, be labeled a sex offender. Yeah, because because what is what does sex offender mean anymore? They've destroyed the term. Because it's everybody, according to them. Yeah, I mean, basically, sex offender means... I mean, that Argento, means... that's insane. That's crazy. I didn't... Oh, my God. Yeah. And the whole thing is... That's, that's legitimate. But some of it... Like, Louis C.K., even, I'd say, is... Oh, I agree. I mean, like, they... He they, asked if he can asked. I masturbate in front of you. Yeah. You and they gave him okay. the thumbs. They, they gave him the thumbs up. And and now he's I'm the bad sorry guy. I'm sorry you felt bad about it later. That's really not his fault. Um, that kind of stuff... This is where the whole it all falls apart right mm -hmm. so everybody all of a sudden has to think like oh god what did, did i do something yeah you know did, what have i oh, have i had sex with a human being before i mean really the only people who are free from from this kind of castigation are the incels are, are virgins and you know what <laughs> congrats then I, yeah you you guys are winning. well no you're not because they'll still claim that shit anyway you know but uh, that's true that's true. That's the whole problem, though, is that, yeah, now I think people are more afraid of being labeled hypocrites. Um, and, and you know what? I'm actually kind of okay with that because mm -hmm. maybe it will stop some of the, the rampant, um, absolute rampant false allegations. Well, either Me Too is either going to destroy uh, the West or it's going to destroy itself. So I'd rather it destroy mm -hmm. itself, personally. Like, I, I want it to just eat its own asshole until it's gone. And uh, so I got a couple super chats from people. And if you guys have any questions or statements you'd like to make, go ahead. Uh, we're going to be quitting pretty soon because we got to do an after show where we continue the conversation. Um, but the Great Indoors gives us five euros. I didn't know you guys were still allowed to uh, send super chats. I heard some people saying that they couldn't do it. I don't know if it has to do with Article hmm. 13. Um, but uh, if so, then, oh, you know, RIP, RIP in peace, uh, Europe. So five euros and Great Indoors says, so if you were to be asked, do you consider yourself 100% male? Some people would answer that in a way they think society in general would approve, question mark. Uh, yeah, you know what? I bet today if you ask men if they consider themselves 100% male and use those words, 100% male, and you did so in public uh, in like social media, I bet you get a surprising number that would not say 100%. That they would dial it back a little bit because because I think first off when you frame the question that way, like if you just say, "Do you consider yourself to be a man?" I think that most men would say, "Yes, yeah, sure." But if you said, "Do you consider yourself to be one hundred percent male?" I think that a lot of men would immediately pause at the one hundred percent part and they think to themselves, "What percentage of me is male?" Because I can't be a hundred percent male. That's this you know, is actually a and, study I believe is being referred to. Because I, I, I've seen data that were brought up that said, essentially, like, you know, only like 5% of men consider themselves 100% male. Yeah. Do you, are you familiar with that? I, I've seen I it am, before. I, I think I've seen it. somewhere in yeah. the back of my that, skull. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think what you're saying is right, is that when you get asked that question, this is, this is the problem with methodology, right? You ask a really weird question like that to people, sometimes they don't know how to respond to it. Mm -hmm. And... The problem is, without extensive qualitative backing, we can't know what that question meant to people, what it meant in their heads when they were answering it. This is the purpose of qualitative data. Hooray! I, I'm usually mostly quantitative, but this mm -hmm. is why we need people to explain their answers. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because people will answer it in a, in a way that is not 100%, because just because of the fact the question has the word 100% in it, or the phrase, Right. Uh, it's very okay. definitive. That's yeah. limiting and puts people in a box. Yeah, you're basically asking people not to say 100% by saying mm -hmm. that. So, uh, and Albert Nada, or Nada, gives us $10 Canadian. Thank you, Albert. Uh, and says, please talk about the sexual harassment that occurred on the set of North County 
or North Country in a future episode. I have all the info on a video I made. It's in the description box. Okay, I'll look into it. Um, I don't know much about it. I don't even know about that show. I'm sorry, I've never heard. It's of a it. show. I yeah I, I yeah oh, I guess I, so. I'm he said now. on the I set thought... of North Country must be must be a show. Sounds like it. Set so. or, or film? I'm I'm not I'm not aware. Um, yeah, it's something. I'll look it up though. I'll look it up. Uh, let's see. So that's it for super chats. Um, is there anything else that we should like maybe bring up before we uh, close the show out, Aiden? I I thought this was a great topic, by the way. Yeah, I'm I'm choice. glad you liked it. And and by the way, like this is just always a really cool thing to uh, be aware of for all of us. The the spiral of science theory, despite all the criticisms of it, and eh, it needs we just any theory in the social sciences the 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 underline is always we need more evidence no matter how well it's supported uh this was some good piece of evidence for it and i just found it really funny that it was i think printed in the exact same no this was uh the other one was in journalism and mass Comm quarterly the the other one was in um uh, uh it says that would be mass common society which is one of our best journals but um they're both good journals mm -hmm. and the idea though is that they were published around the same time so it's just kind of funny to me that uh yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, we need to talk more on social media because it means that we're less likely to fall victim of the spiral of silence. But be aware about only pay attention, paying attention to mass media or to social media for all of your news because it might mean it won't cause. There's no causal link. It's just a correlational link. It might mean you're less likely to be well informed about everything. Now I. Again, that's on Facebook news, and we know what Facebook promotes. So, exactly. Ciara De Flora gives us two dollars and says, "Love you, fellow Badgers." Well, thank you, Ciara De Flora. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap up the show and go into the after show. If you want to be a part of the after show, you have to become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash Honey Badger Radio. Uh, we're gonna just keep talking about this or whatever else the patrons want to talk about. Uh, I also wanted to ask you guys to please like, subscribe the channel, and uh, hit the bell for notifications. Um, leave a comment about this topic. I really want to know if you guys um, have a any experience with this this uh, s downward spiral of silence. Maybe you have friends that do. and uh, Or are you just somebody who just doesn't give a fuck and has that cost you anything socially? How many friends have you lost? I've lost plenty of real-life friends. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's yeah it's a shame but it, it happens and i think it's not it's not because i was mean it's because they don't like what i'm saying and it, it just sort of, it activates something in their brain that they cannot handle and, and actually jaffe talked about it when i talked to him on friday he said i hear what you're saying and i get that it's really logical but i can't shake the fact that it sounds like misogynistic hate speech and i'm serious when he said that oh. and there's probably a study related to to this phenomenon of people hearing something but but misconstruing it intentionally or otherwise as something a lot worse. So uh, that's uh, just good old cognitive dissonance. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It hurts. It hurts. My it brain. does. It's it's psychologically. Yeah. We we've actually measured it. It measures in the same region of the brain as pain. Mm -hmm. To be proven wrong, it's yep. the same part of the brain lights up <laughs> as, as physical pain. So yep, that yeah. does not feel good to be wrong. No, it, it sucks. It does. It, unless you learn humility, but that's not, that's not very common. So, all right. Well, anyways, uh, leave us a comment. I hope to talk to you guys very soon and I'll see you tomorrow. All right. Have a good.